Welcome to another Roden Schwartz webinar looking into fascinating aspects of LTE. My name is Andreas Rösler and I'm working as technology manager for Roden Schwartz with a focus on LTE LTE Advanced. Today I would like to spend some time with you on mobility aspects in LTE, commonly understood as handover, but there's more in it. Mobility can be handled under the umbrella of radio resource management, short RRM. RRM encompasses a wide range of procedures that include, among others, tech needs that are based on radio quality measures made by the LTE capable terminal, such as cell search, cell reselection handover, or radio link monitoring. Therefore, RRM related measures can be basically divided into actions executed if the terminal has a passive connection with the network or an active one. And that's the first item today that we will take a closer look at. Passive and active connection to the network are understood as different radio resource control states the terminal can have with the network. After the terminal is powered up, it is not attached, its location is unknown to the network and no IP address has been assigned. Immediately the UE will start with the cell search and selection process looking for the two synchronization signals, cell specific reference signals, performing quality measures on these reference signals to judge if the found cell is a suitable one to camp on. For a complete judgment the terminal needs to read certain system information provided by the system information block type 1, zip type 1. Additional system information, the one provided in zip type 2, will enable the device to do the random access procedure to move to an active connection with the network, known as RRC connected state. During a random access procedure, the network allocates an identity to the terminal called CRNTI, which stands for Cell Radio Network Temporary Identity. Further, an IP address and a tracking area ID are assigned. There are now two substates for RRC connected. The substate we reach during initial random access procedure is called InSync. In this substate, downlink and uplink transmission are possible. After a while of inactivity, the terminal shuts down its transmitter to reduce power consumption. Remember, we have a battery operated device. It moves into DTX mode, short for discontinuous transmission, and is out of sync. To restore the lost uplink synchronization, the random access procedure will be used. Being further inactive, the device will move into discontinuous reception, short DRX mode. Here only the paging channel and the downlink is monitored following a defined period. This is also defined as RRC idle state. To move into an active state again, the terminal will use the random access procedure. The DRX cycle is quite flexible and configurable by the network. A short and a long DRX cycle is possible. The DRX cycle is given in numbers of subframes where for the long DRX cycle the maximum is 2560 subframes or in other words 2560 milliseconds. That would mean the device would monitor only every 2.56 seconds the PDCCH for any incoming paging message. A bunch of other parameters and events are influencing the cycle even further. For further information on discontinuous reception please study the technical specification 36 dot three to one defining the medium access protocol for LTE. To move into an active in sync state again the device uses another time the random access procedure. When the device is switched off, tracking area ID, IP address are deallocated. The question is now what happens to mobility when the UE is either in RC idle or RC connected state. As you can see we need to discuss at least two aspects of LTE mobility here. First the device is in idle mode, camping on an LTE cell, where the receiving quality might become worse. First, it needs to monitor neighboring cells or even other RADS radio access technologies that the device supports, for instance. Second, the UE has an active connection with the LTE network, is receiving and or transmitting data and is leaving coverage of the serving cell or LTE coverage in general. Third, and not particularly mentioned in this graphic, what is if there is a voice call coming in or if a voice call is already established via the IMS network, known as VOLTI call, voice over LTE, but the device leaves LTE coverage. The desire is of course to seamlessly hand over the call to another radio access technology such as 3G wideband CDMA. The related procedure is known as Single Radio Voice Call Continuity, SRVCC, and we will take a look on this important aspect of LTE testing towards the end of this webcast.
As you can see, quite some topics which we try to tackle in the next minutes. Some we touch more in detail, some on a higher level, purely due to the time constraints putting everything into 45 minutes. Let's start simple and categorize handovers. Generally, we distinguish between three types. First, there's the initial sale selection. Then, there's sale reselection. This could be within LTE, while the device is moving through the LTE network, uh, where coverage is still provided. But it could be also from LTE to another radio access technology, short RAT. In my example, I'm using here HRPD, High Rate Packet Data, also known as 1x EVDO and 1x RTT, so 3GBP2 defined technologies. The cell reselection process is, as discussed, under the control of the device, means when there is no active connection with the network. In case there is an active connection, the handover is a cell redirection. Again, there are several options. In LT, on the same carrier frequency, the same band, in that case we call that intra-frequency handover. Or, still in LTE, to a different carrier frequency that could be in the same frequency band, but is most likely in, dif in a different frequency band. An example would be an network operator that provides coverage for the macro network on a frequency band in the lower megahertz range, for example band 20, which is used in Europe and is in the 800 megahertz range. The operator may also have deployed smaller Pico cells in band 7, which is also a European band, which are frequencies around 2.6 GHz. In this example, the cell redirection could happen from band 20, 800 MHz, to band 7, 2.6 GHz. This would be called interfrequency handover. Last but not least, there would be a seamless handover or cell redirection to another RAT or another frequency band, for example from LTE to HRPD or 1XRTT. In idle state, the mobility control is up to the device. Mobility is here equated with real cell reselection, which is based on absolute priorities assigned by the network, where each frequency has its own assigned priority. In connected state, the mobility control is of course under network control. It would be very chaotic if the device could decide when to hand over to another cell with an active connection without knowing the load situation in this or other neighboring cells. Generally speaking, the mobility handling depends for both RRC states, idle and connected, always on quality measurements of the received signal from the serving cell, where the UE camps on, neighboring cells, as well as for the target cell, if it is an LTE to LTE handover, or to a cell belonging to another radio access technology, such as GSM, wideband CDMA, or 1XRTT, 1XEVDO. These quality measures are carried out on the cell-specific reference signals that are embedded over the entire system bandwidth in terms of LTE. In the frequency domain, they occupy every six subcarrier, means twice per resource block. The initialization of the sequence used for the reference signals is based on the cell's identity and therefore cell-specific. The cell's identity is detected by the terminal while reading primary and secondary synchronization signal. Two measurements are now taken for determining the quality of the received signal from the serving cell. Reference signal received power, RSRP, an average measurement over all reference signals but excluding noise and such. And then there is reference signal received quality, short RSRQ. This parameter sets the RSRP into a relationship or better ratio with the RSSI, received signal strength indicator, which includes noise, interference and such. RSRP is measured in idle and connected mode, whereas RSRQ is only measured and reported in connected state. So these are the LTE specific measurements. Now to detect neighboring cells on the same carrier frequency, the minimum requirement is that there is a good enough signal to noise ratio for the synchronization signals to detect dead cells. If the SNR is at least 6 dB, minus 6 dB or better, cells can be detected. Simulations have shown that cells could be then detected in equal or less than 800 milliseconds. This is also assuming that there is no DRX cycle defined. Further, that there is no measurement gap configured to measure different LTE frequency bands or other radio access technologies. In terms of other radio access technologies, the quality measurements are of course different than the one I just described for LTE. All the related measurements 
that the terminal has to carry it out depending on which access technologies are supported in addition to LTE are specified in FreeGBP's technical specification 36.214 for physical layer measurements. Which brings me to the next item, interfrequency or interrut measurements. Independent if the device has to measure LTE cells that are in a different frequency band or other technologies, the device has presumably only one receiver, so it needs to retune this receiver to do the defined quality measurements. And this requires time. So the LTE network uh, need to provide the device with this time with these so-called periodic measurement gaps. As you can see, there are two gap patterns defined. Uh, the measurement gap itself, it's always six milliseconds in duration, but the periodicity for the measurement gap repetition period is different and could be 40 or 80 milliseconds. So every 40 or 80 milliseconds, there is a gap where the device can retune its receiver to do quality measurements either on a different frequency bands for LTE, uh, measuring RSRP, for instance, in a connected state and also RSRQ, or doing these quality measurements for the other radio access technologies. And as I said, all these are specified in the mentioned specification 36.214. Before we take a closer look on the initial cell selection that I already mentioned and then further the cell reselection procedure, a first quick look on how the network supports the mobility procedures with system information. System information in LTE are organized in so-called system information blocks and just one of these blocks is provided on a dedicated channel. This is the MIB, short for Master Information Block, which is carried on the physical broadcast channel, PBCH. And all other system information are provided uh, through the network using the shared channel principle. The MIB is acquired during cell search and provides information on system bandwidth, the system frame number, and indirectly also on a number of used transmission antennas. The system information block type 1 has a fixed scheduling, um, is transmitted every 80 milliseconds, but is already transmitted using that shared channel principle. The important information here, and that's why I mention it, is for the cell selection, as it provides a relevant input and parameters that are impacting the so-called cell selection criteria. And so uh, the next step for us is, of course, to take a look at these cell selection criteria. The definition for this criteria is shown in this equation. It is fulfilled means the device will camp on the cell if the reception level, short as Rx left, is greater than zero. This reception level is computed based on measurements taken on the receive quality of this particular serving cell, as well as cell specific information, as I said, provided by the system information block type 1. First part is the so-called QRX level measurement, which corresponds to nothing else than the reference signal receive power and is expressed in dBm. The next value is the minimum level in this cell, also given in dBm. This value is signals as QRX level minimum in the system information block type 1 and could be in the range of minus 70 to minus 22. And this value is then multiplied with 2 to define a wider range and is, as I said, expressed also in dBm. The next value is an offset uh, that is only taken into account as a result of periodic search for a higher priority public land mobile network. Um, it's basically defined to avoid ping pong effects between different networks in case of um, roaming, for instance, if this value is also part of the zip type 1. Uh, but it, if, if it is not uh, transmitted, then it's assumed to be zero. The value is expressed in dB. And last but not least, we have uh, P compensation as shown a maximum function. That means whatever parameter is higher, P E max subtracted from P U max or zero. That's the value for P compensation. P E max is the maximum power U, uh, a UE, a device is allowed to use in the cell and corresponds to the Pmax value that is transmitted in zip type 1 and Pumax is uh, general the maximum transmission power in LTE which is defined with plus 23 dBm for all frequency bands. The Pmax value or Pemax could be in the range of uh, minus 30 to plus 33 dBm 
So only when P max or P max uh, is greater than plus 23 dBm, the P compensation value is considered uh, while calculating these cell selection criteria. Okay, the next step is that I would like to check uh, what are actual values that are transmitted in the system information block type 1. So what we are going to do is we are using the Roden Schwartz drive test solution that consists out of a TSMW uh, universal network scanner um, in the top left corner, which is a very sensitive receiver. The scanner has two RF front ends that can estimate the radio channel while determining the channel metrics, for instance, calculating out of that the condition number and so give a real uh, estimate if MIMO, that means special multiplexing, 2x2 or even 4x2 is possible. Um, that can be compared to the information the device receiving. Um, all in all, this is a different story that I should explain another time. The solution is completed with ro the Romus drive test software that's running on a PC that controls the TSNW and also the mobile device. And several terminals or chipsets have been integrated already into the Roma software. Uh, an example for LTE are here Samsung uh, devices or Qualcomm chipsets. We need to take a look at the Roma software and uh, we look straight at the data that are coming from the scanner from the TSMW. On the top left corner you see all the LTE base stations that the scanner has detected. In the example I've set the unit up to scan band 17 so 700 megahertz range and uh, band 4, 2 uh, gigahertz frequencies in these two bands, AT&T and Metro PCS have deployed their LTE networks here in the United States. And the Roma software has also uh, LTE BCH, so System Information Demodulator integrated, that allows the software to extract, same as the LTE mobile would do, the system information from the received base stations, uh, depending on the SNR, signal-to-noise ratio. Um, of course, it's configurable for the scanner. And this is what you see on the left-hand side in the top corner. If we expand the tree for that particular base station, the strongest signal that is detected that you can see here, uh, we can now check the system information block type 1. There's um, relevant information in for the cell selection criteria as you can see here. Um, so for Pmax uh, it's plus 23 dBn which corresponds already to the maximum allowed uh, device power anyway. The QRX level min is set to minus 60 which needs to be multiplied with the factor of 2 and leads therefore to minus 120 dBm. And as we can see there's no QRS level offset or offset uh, part of that uh, system information block type 1 so it's assumed to be 0 dBm. Other carriers um, use other settings. So this example that I just uh, pulled up here um, are the settings for Verizon Wireless um, at the same location where QIX level is given the same value, minus 60. Uh, however, the offset value is now available and defined with 4 dB and Pmax provided uh, maximum allowed power in that particular cell. It's also plus 23 dBm, which leads to the um, thing that the power consumption is uh, not impacting the cell selection criteria and as you can see uh, here in the quotation putting all these values in the reception level for the reference signal in this particular cell could be as low as minus 124 dBm per 15 kilohertz and the cell is still a suitable one that the device could camp on. So, so far the system information block types one in an actual network. So in a real network, the device moves after the cell selection and if there is no data to be received or transmitted into the idle mode as we have seen or heard. In this mode, it switches off transmitter and receiver and only occasionally wakes up and listens to the downlink to the paging channel. It is obvious that in this mode, the device should consume less power. So question is how to transfer the device into the mode to check, for instance, on its power consumption. With the CMW500 wideband radio communication tester from Roland Schwartz, shown here in the picture, this is actually pretty straightforward, while configuring the actual behavior of the emulated LTE cell. Via the configuration button, shown here on the uh, left bottom corner, uh, the LTE signal configuration menu will appear. It shows several entries, one is called connection. By expanding the menu tree, several 
uh, settings are shown that are related to the connection that shall be established to the device. The setting of interest is called Keep RC Connection, which needs to be disabled. While doing so, the established default EPS bearer during the attach procedure is released after the successful attach. This can be verified in the event log that's part of the LTE signaling graphical user interface and shown here. By the way, the event log is available in all technologies, not just LTE. It displays the state of the connection and helps to identify configuration issues uh, right away, for instance, such as wrong security settings for the SIM card that's used for testing, for example. In the actual screenshot taken from the CMW, you can now see that the cell has been switched on. An RC connection has been initiated. The EPS default bearer has been established. Uh, right after the device is attached, an IP address has been assigned. In many cases, the default bearer is kept alive. However, with disabling the Keep RC connection setting in the connection menu, the connection is released. What we can now do is check the device power consumption and doing some uh, so-called battery life testing. Battery life testing in general is an important test step that check what is the actual power consumption of the device for certain scenarios. LTE as a technology provides low latency and high data rates as we know. This is only possible with fast processors in a device handling the data traffic. Fast processors means high power consumption and not to mention the power consumption of the high-end displays used in today's smartphones. Uh, therefore many network operators require power consumption or in other words battery life testing while doing, for instance, FTP down or uploads, further TCP and UDP down and uploads. And in addition, there are requirements to test the power consumption in idle mode, which could be done with the displayed solution using the knowledge we just gained. The CMW emulates the LTE network the device will register to, executing the steps described on the previous slide. The device would move into the idle mode, which will enable the user to perform battery life tests in this particular RRC state. The Roland Schwartz NGMO2 power supply is used to power the device, but also to read the current power consumption and drain usage. Both CMW500 uh, and NGMO2 are controlled by a software developed by a sof Roland Schwartz partner company called Analitech that is based in the United Kingdom. If you want to learn more, come and visit our booth at CTI Wireless 2012, held in May 8th or 10th in New Orleans, Louisiana. Back to our main topic, LTE mobility, after checking out idle mode. As seen, after picking a suitable cell, the UE starts the cell reselection process in addition. But in order to further save battery power, there are rules defined when the terminal needs to start quality measurements on intra-frequency, inter-frequency or inter-red cells. There are specific thresholds defined in terms of intra-frequency measurements, so on neighboring cells on the same carrier frequency in the same frequency band, measurements should be executed when the receiving level of the serving cell is equal or below a threshold defined as intra-search that is provided by higher layers. Same is true for EUTRAN interfrequency measurements, means for LTE, but on a different carrier frequency that is potentially also in a different frequency band, as well as interred measurements, so on other technologies, for example GSM. The value is called here as non intra search But where does the device know these thresholds from? And this brings us back to the system information in LTE. We just learned about the importance for the in-system information block type 1 during the cell selection process. Now for cell reselection, but also cell redirection to LTE and other radio access technologies, the ZIPs types 3 to 8 are of importance. For LTE cell reselection in general, cell reselection for interfrequency and interfrequency purposes, these are uh, system information blocks type 3, 4 and 5, highlighted here in blue. So now let's look at the system information block type 3 as an example. Displays are here the details. I highlighted both of the thresholds we just discussed, non intra search and intra search. The value for reselection threshold is according to latest version of technical specification 36331 for defining the radio resource control protocol in LTE in the range of 0 to 31 that needs to be multiplied with a factor of 2 and is then expressed 
in DB. In addition, this zip includes again the parameters required for calculating the cell selection criteria. The time that is available for cell reselection is specified here in the T reselection information element. This value could be in the range of 0 to 7 seconds. So what are the values that are being uh, broadcasted in today's deployed LTE networks? This brings us back to the LTE BCH demodulator functionality and the Roden Schwartz Romus drive test software. If we stick with Verizon Wireless, we can take a look at zip type 3 and 4. First, the time to perform reselection is given here with 2, which corresponds to 2 seconds. So the device has two seconds to perform a cell reselection. And the priority is defined with five. The cell reselection priority is defined in a range from zero to seven, where zero means lowest priority. The threshold for serving frequency used in reselection evaluation towards lower priority frequencies or radio access technologies is set here to two. The S intra search parameter is set to 31, which we need to multiply with 2, which further leads to 62 dB as value. This means as soon as the received level reaches minus 62 dBm, the device has to monitor its neighboring cells. The question is now, which are these cells? Well, this is defined in system information block type 4. Here in the example, the listed neighboring cells have the cells, uh, the identities 93 and 388. Now we have one serving cell and two neighboring cells. Of course, there could be more neighboring cells depending on the geographical location of this particular base station. But even if we have only two cells, as in the example, uh, we need to rank them for evaluation, so a cell ranking is required. This is also defined in the standards and is influenced by provided system information, namely the type 3 and type 4 system information blocks. So the ranking is computed separately for serving and neighboring cells based on the shown relation. The received quality for both type of cells uh, serving and neighboring needs to be determined by estimating the RSRP, which stands again for reference signal received power. Then for the serving cell, there is a hysteresis parameter that comes with the system information block type 3. And for the neighboring cells, there are offsets to the serving cell defined, which could be different per cell. In the example, they are uh, 3dB. Based on this equation, the cells will be ranked, which help the device to determine to which cell to perform the reselection to. This screenshot is a combination that is easily made possible with the Romus software. Combine the view of the LTE system information demodulator, which you see on the left hand side, and also including what the, the device an actual real D LTE device is seeing that is registered with the LTE network but controlled by the Romus drive test software. As we see, the device has a serving cell, um, has the cell identity 124. Zip type 3 of that cell provides the device with the information which neighboring cells to monitor. It's exactly the same example as on the previous slide, cells 93 and 388. And as we can see, the device monitors this and many other cells that all have a pretty low reception level and ranks them based on the previously discussed ranking criteria. We have just seen the configuration in a real-world network, LTE network, where the decoded system information which we captured with the scanner and the drive test software. Uh, question is, can cell reselection also be verified in the lab? And the answer is yes, of course. The CMW500 wideband ready communication tester can be used for this to test the reselection functionality on a LTE device. The configuration for cell reselection tests are set in the network settings for the LTE signal configuration. Expanding the menu tree lists several parameters for LTE, GSM, UTRA, so 3G wideband CMA, and CDMA 2000 1X RTT 1X EVDO. The four later ones are covered in the system information blocks type 6 and uh, through 8. At the bottom, the information are listed that are provided by zip type 3. 
and which are of relevance for L LTE intra-frequency measurements. It's the minimum RSRP received level for the serving cell, here 60 minus 60 dBm, before considering cell reselection. The next parameter is the discussed intra-search parameter that forces the phone to take quality measurements on neighboring cells. Trying to reproduce the previous real-world scenario, I've set this to 31 corresponding to 62 dB. The actual range for these parameters is 0 to 62 dB. Next is the list of neighboring frequencies. These cells can be configured by pushing the Edit button, which opens another menu. And to stick with our real-world example, I just activated two neighboring cells, gave them the displayed IDs and set the offset of to the serving cell. The range for the offset is minus 24 to plus 24 dB. As you can see by selecting another frequency band, for instance the AWS band, band 4, you can also configure the neighbor cells to being on a different frequency band and so doing inter-frequency measurements here. Now the CMW, or better, the emulated cell would broadcast this information as part of the system information. The actual procedure, how to do that, is of course a step-by-step -step approach. Uh, first of all, you need a dual-channel CMW500. Then you need to set up the LTE serving cell, configure the enable cell list appropriately, as I've shown on the previous slide. Second is to set up another LTE cell that matches one of the neighbors uh, that have been configured and uh, broadcasted over the system information. Then, of course, switch on the UE. The UE is the um, attaching to the serving cell and reading in the system information. And FUS knows which neighboring cells to monitor um, if that is interfrequency or interfrequency. Uh, measurements um, can be configured as I've uh, shown and then of course we need to lower the power of the serving cell uh, to reach the um, uh, um, threshold to uh, make the UE start for looking for neighboring cells and the next last step would be then uh, lower the power even further to reach the threshold where the UE would start to perform and cell reselection to for instance LT. As we discussed in the beginning, there are quality measurements defined for mobility in LTE. For LTE itself, these are the discussed RSRP and RSRQ measurements. For the other radio access technologies, there are different measurements unique to these standards, such as C-pitch RSCP for 3G wideband CDMA, or pilot strength for 1XRTT HRPD, to just name a few. So far we discussed only mobility in idle mode, um, when the device has only a passive connection with the network and where the mobility controls up to the device. The performed measurement and their results are only applicable to the device and used to perform cell reselection either to LTE or to another uh, RAT. But only in connected mode where the mobility control is with the network, the measurements are being reported by the terminal. And as we have learned, some measurements are only taken in connected mode. RSRQ is the example I'm referring to. RSRQ only measured in connected mode where RSRP is measured in idle as well as in connected mode. The question is now when the device sends such a so-called measurement report and further what is being reported in terms of quantity I mean. For the mobility within LTE there are certain events defined that trigger such a measurement report. In total there are six events looking at the latest specification where the last one is just being specified for LT advanced as of 3GBP release 10 means the enhancements to LT to make it a true 4G mobile communication technology uh, we will ignore that event for the time being and all other events that definition is displayed. For internet mobility two events are being defined uh, B1 and B2. The LTE mobility events A1 through A5 are all defined for intra as well as interfrequency measurements and handovers. Uh, one of the important events is event A3 uh, that I would like to explain a little bit further. So for A3, let's assume the following receiving level for the serving cell displayed here in blue. Let's further assume that there is a neighboring cell here in orange, the same frequency that has 
the displayed reception level. Obviously there is an offset where the neighboring cell offers better receiving quality than the actual serving cell. Now to avoid any ping pong effects there is a hysteresis defined. The hysteresis relaxes the offset definition in terms of when the device has to issue a measurement report. This period I'm talking about is called time to trigger. This is the time period for which one a certain condition, in this example the condition for the event A3 is true. Or in other words where the neighbor cell becomes better than an offset relative to the serving cell. An entering condition is defined that is calculated based on several parameters. The receive level for both cells, serving and neighboring is determined. The measured value is the reference signal receive power again short RSRP which is expressed in DBM, um, that there are several frequency and cell specific offsets defined for the serving and the neighboring cell where all the values are expressed in DB and last but not least we have the hysteresis definition that's impacting the entering condition. Um, the same holds true for the leaving condition, same parameters but just uh, differently configured in an unequal relationship to each other. If the trigger point is passed, the device is configured by means of the so-called report config EUTRA information element to how often it has to send now a measurement report and what's the time between these reports. The first information is signaled as report amount that can be up to 64 reports where the report interval can be between 120 milliseconds and up to 60 minutes. Of course not all configuration makes sense um, but these are just the displayed ranges for these two things. Um, how often a report is required and what's the interval between these different reports. Now with the reported information the network is enabled to decide to initiate a handover cell redirection procedure. The UE provides a measurement report that is for instance triggered by the event A3. That's basically the start of the handover procedure, the cell redirection procedure for instance to EUTRA, which I'm using here as an example. The source e B, the source base station, tasks one or more target cells to prepare for the handover where it sends for example an RC context information that include current RC configuration, the UE capabilities and the radio resource management information, um, the e -Node B controlling the target cells generates then the handover command and transfers this back to the source e -Node B and all this is done under the handover preparation. Uh, within the RC connection reconfiguration message the source e -Node B will forward the handover command transparently to the device means it will neither add nor modify any information within that command. However, it will add information about the target cell, for example its identity and optionally the frequency of the target cell. In addition, it provides the device with the radio resource configuration that is common to all devices in the target cell as for example the information on how to perform the random access procedure. It further includes the identity that uh, has to be used in the target cell um, which is the CR and TI. Measurement configurations for the target cell and such might be part of another reconfiguration procedure to avoid that the message becomes extremely large. After receiving the RC connection reconfiguration uh, message from the source e -Node B, the device uh, starts a timer, the timer 304, which is the timer for the handover to EUTRA failure and initiates the random access procedure to the target cell. It can do that because it hasn't, it has not to acquire any system information since the essential information to execute random access procedure are part of the RC connection reconfiguration message that's being received from the source e -Node B. And after the successful completion of the random access procedure, the device stops this T304 timer and sends the RSC connection reconfiguration complete message to the target e -Node B. 
Of course, the UTRAN handover can be also executed with the RNS CMW500 wideband radio communication tester. Um, the screenshots I'm taking here um, is that the device has been registered and attached to the network, to the emulated LTE network, um, which is here on the band 13. And as soon as that has happened, uh, you could establish a connection, but the handover button has been already enabled and we can perform a handover here for instance to do a bandwidth change but also to change the network signaling values or activate them uh, is a better term here and why all this is important is um, all RF parametric and RF conformance tests specified by FreeGBP require in one frequency band three channels to be tested and per channel three different bandwidths and if we wouldn't have the handover procedure we of course have to power cycle the device and that would extend the time of testing but with a handover with a redirection we are able to change the handover and maintain the call and so reduce test time and that's of course important imagine your device supports different frequency bands uh, several bandwidths and has also to be tested for this additional network signaling which straighten the limits for instance for spurious emission tests for power measurements and all these has to be done on a device so handover are very important and could be executed with the CMW500. So far we uh, only discussed basic uh, handovers for active data connections however there are special handovers which are said that we are talking towards the end of the webcast here and one of these special handovers is uh, the single radio voice call continuity. It's rather really complex uh, uh, kind of handover. It's basically related to the challenge of providing voice uh, which is a circuit switch service over the LTE network that is a completely packet switch and all IP based network. Uh, the long-term solution that several network operators currently implement into their deployed network is to deliver the voice call via the IP multimedia subsystem, short IMS. Uh, IMS is an access independent overlay to the existing mobile radio networks to provide seamless service continuity for voice, for SMS, for video, for video streaming, uh, things like that. And the challenge is, of course, now handing such a voice call over to uh, when, when you're leaving LTE coverage, for instance, and there's only 2G or 3G available. So a voice call established via IMS is basically a pure IP connection as LTE is still in hotspot area deployment. Uh, the major question is now how to hand over this IP connection to a circuit switch connection in a 2, 2G or 3G technology to maintain the call while leaving LTE coverage and that's the question. Uh, what basically is required is a packet switch to circuit switch handover via the IMS network. And as the block diagram shows, there are several network nodes involved, including the mobile switching center, uh, uh, server, uh, UTRAN or GRAN network elements, that's dependent if the handover is targeting 3G wideband CDMA or GSM, and of course the IMS portion of the network. So let's take a closer look to how such a handover happens by analyzing uh, one of the message logs that are coming from the CMW500, this time configured as a LTE protocol tester. So the following messages and message logs are coming from a successfully executed SRVCC handover test case using a real device. First, we assume that the device is already attached and registered with the LTE network. The next step is to establish a dedicated EPS bearer for the IMS voice call. This is initiated by sending the correct context request. It is further important that the quality of service is ensured, for instance, guaranteed uh, bit rates and such. Um, that's displayed on the right hand side, uh, the quality of service negotiation here. And the next step is to configure the device to look for the 3G cell that's also emulated by the CMW500 and measure their quality. Um, for this, our RSC connection reconfiguration message is sent um, to monitor this neighboring cell. And if the device has received this message, decoded this uh, properly and retuned its uh, receiver to perform the quality measurement, it's of course going to send a measurement report that includes the measurement results. 
After receiving a measurement report, the CMW500 sends the mobility from a Utra command to transfer the device from LTE to 3G, which includes also the radio access bearer setup uh, for 3G for wideband CDMA. The radio access bearer setup is shown in the right bottom corner. It includes many, many information, for instance, also which audio codecs shall be used for the voice call to be maintained, um, if that is narrowband AMR or wideband AMR, for instance. Afterwards, the device sends the handover complete message and performs right after that a routing area update and acquires new security keys that's displayed in the two um, lower left bottom uh, pictures. And um, all in all, this is then the whole procedure transferring an IMS voice call from LTE to 3G by maintaining the call and setting it up as a in the circuit switched domain. For those of you who would like to see this as a live demonstration, I encourage you to come to CTI Wireless 2012 being held from May 8th to 10th in New Orleans, Louisiana. Here we will be demonstrating with our partners NVIDIA and D2 Technologies the SRVCC uh, handover uh, that we have been first time demonstrating at a mobile congress in Barcelona in February this year and where I took the picture from. What you basically see here is the CMW500 uh, radio communication tester uh, providing the LTE cell and emulating also the 3G cell. We're using the NVIDIA iSERA 410 uh, device, which is an LTE wide wind CDMA modem or tablet, if you like. And on that uh, device is uh, running D2 Technologies IMS software client. The device registers with LTE, as I emphasized on the previous two slides, uh, registers with the IMS network. We're emulating 3G. Uh, as well, uh, we lower the power of the LT device, we're sending a mobility of the cell, we're sending a mobility command and actually you see here, I hope you can see it, the headphones, you can actually see, uh, listen to the active voice call and, and also determine the short delay that is between switching from LTE packet switch to 3G circuit switched uh, voice call. So don't forget to see us at CTA if you're interested in a live demonstration of SR uh, VCC, Single Radio Voice Call Continuity. But beside that, you could also take a look at the draft test solution that I used during this webcast quite some time to um, analyze system information, but also the CMW500 Wideband Radio Communication Tester in many other applications. With this, I'm at the end of our short excourse into LT mobility. I hope you enjoyed it a little bit, um, looking at different mobility aspects, uh, how the mobility is handled if the device is in idle mode, uh, has to perform cell reselection to LTE cells or to other technologies, what are the impacting parameters and uh, where the device knows them from. Uh, or acquires them from, basically system information, and then of course in the connected mode, using an example here, an LTE, LTE to LTE handover, or at the end, a rather complex uh, uh, handover, single radio voice call continuity. Again, thank you very much for your attention.